Hi, my name is Dr. Ben Webb. Welcome to today's video. We're going to talk about the emotional brain, the part of the brain that controls how you feel and your emotional memories. How are you feeling right now? Are you relaxed on your sofa, watching this video, thinking about what, it's, what you're going to cook for dinner? Or maybe you are tense with your shoulders hunched up over your computer, thinking about an upcoming deadline. You would think that it's easy to work out if we are happy or sad, angry or calm. But we experience a vast array of emotions throughout our lives and it can be really difficult to distinguish one from another and know how to respond appropriately. When we describe our emotions, we typically label them in a way that reflects how we feel. Love, sadness, fear, happiness, anger, disgust, panic, or even depressed. But what causes us to feel an emotion? Let's use an extreme example to illustrate what I mean. You're walking to work and you see a lion up ahead that has escaped from the local zoo. Fear courses through your body and in an instant you're poised to run away. You might think that seeing the lion causes your feeling of fear, but actually it's the feeling in your body that you perceive as fear, not seeing the lion. We feel afraid because our body is preparing to act in a particular way, not vice versa. In this case, preparing to run away. To understand what causes you to feel emotions, we need to dive deep inside your brain to look at an ancient set of structures. Every time you feel something, your body initiates a physiological response, releases brain chemicals, and initiates a behavioral re response. At the center of this process is the limbic system, which is often labeled your emotional brain. The limbic system is one of the oldest parts of your brain. It evolved in early humans, is a group of brain structures that surround the brainstem, which include the amygdala, hypothalamus, thalamus, cingulate cortex, and hippocampus. Our limbic system governs our emotional experiences, emotional memories, emotional learning, survival instincts, and regulates our bodily functions. Early humans were exposed to the constant threat of being killed or injured by wild animals or other tribes. To improve their chances of survival, the fight, flight or freeze response evolved as an automatic response to physical danger that allows you to react quickly without thinking. When you feel threatened and afraid, it is the amygdala that automatically activates the fight, flight, freeze response. The hypothalamus increases your heart rate, quickens your breathing, redirects blood flow to your muscles and signals the release of stress hormones that prepare your body to fight, run away or play dead. The fight, flight, freeze response was appropriate for early humans because of the threats of physical harm. Today, there are far fewer physical threats, but there are lots of psychological threats caused by the pressure and stresses of modern life. When stress makes you feel strong anger, aggression or fear, the fight, flight, freeze response has been activated. It often results in a sudden illogical and irrational overreaction to the situation. You may even regret your reaction later. The newer, rational and more advanced part of your brain is the frontal lobe, the large area behind your forehead. This is where thinking, reasoning, decision making and planning happen. The frontal lobe allows you to process and think about your emotions. You can then manage these emotions and determine a logical response. Unlike the automatic response of the amygdala, the response to fear from your frontal lobes is consciously controlled by you. When you sense danger is present, your amygdala wants to automatically activate the fight, flight, freeze response. Ideally, at the same time, your frontal lobe is processing the information to determine if danger really is present and therefore the most logical response to it. When the emotional and thinking brain are working well together, we are able to appropriately and safely respond to what is going on around us. In fact, your emotional intelligence is linked to the interaction between the frontal lobes and the limbic system in your brain. However, there are situations and experiences that can get in the way of these two parts of our brain working well together. If we've experienced trauma, whether it's early in life as neglect or abuse or later in life as PTSD, this can also put our brains into a survival state. The trauma we have experienced changes the way we perceive the threat and danger. The amygdala reacts to misperceived threat or danger in our environment, sending us into a fight, flight, freeze response when we actually, in reality, don't need to respond in this way. When the brain is in this consistent state of fear, it then changes how we might respond to the words someone speaks to us, the tone of their voice, the look someone gives us, or the things that are being asked of us because, we're, because we then are engaged in our fight, flight, freeze response. Let's move on to how your mood is controlled by your brain. 
Your mood is regulated by the chemical messaging system inside your emotional brain and the brain areas it talks to. The neurons inside your head are constantly talking and sending chemical messages to each other. These chemical messages are called neurotransmitters. They're released by one neuron and received by another and let different parts of the brain communicate with each other. There are three neurotransmitters which are heavily involved in regulating your mood. These are dopamine, serotonin and norepinephrine. Dopamine is related to experiences of pleasure and reward. When you do something good, you're rewarded with dopamine and experience a pleasurable, happy feeling. The amount of dopamine released by the brain prior to a behavior is actually proportional to its potential for providing pleasure. So the more pleasurable it is, the more dopamine is released in your brain. This teaches your brain to want to do it again and again. And in fact, the same brain circuits that give you this pleasure are also the ones that can lead to out of control learning that we more commonly refer to as addiction. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter associated with memory and learning. It plays an important part in the regeneration of brain cells, which has been linked to easing depression. An imbalance in serotonin in your brain leads to an increase in anger, anxiety, depression, and even panic. Norepinephrine, also referred to as noradrenaline, helps moderate your mood by controlling stress and anxiety. It is at its lowest levels during sleep, rises during wakefulness, and reaches much higher levels during situations of stress or danger. It increases your arousal and alertness, which can increase restlessness and anxiety. Abnormalities in how the brain receives and processes these chemicals can have a big effect on your emotions. For example, when you do something rewarding or pleasurable, the part of your brain that processes that information is interacting with the chemical dopamine. If your brain can't receive dopamine normally, the result is that you feel less happy or even sad after what should have been a pleasurable and happy experience. And similarly, people who have to live with major depression have less serotonin receptors in their brains. Because neurotransmitters have such an impact on your emotions, tweaking the level of chemicals in your brain can help relieve symptoms of depression. That is actually how most antidepressants work. They change the levels of certain neurotransmitters in your brain, like serotonin, dopamine, or norepinephrine. Some do this by reducing how much neurotransmitter is reabsorbed back into a neuron after it was released, and this raises the levels in your brain and improves your mood. The hippocampus is also part of the limbic system and heavily involved in your memory and your emotional memories. In fact, recalling a negative memory can put you in a bad mood, and thinking about a happy memory can put you in a good mood, and this effect is taking place whether or not you're aware of it. Memory recall can actually be used to regulate mood in people who are experiencing depression because thinking about positive memories causes the brain to release dopamine. Memories of previous experiences influence how you respond emotionally to situations. So for example, people who have lived through a traumatic event can find themselves experience emotional challenges long after the event has actually taken place. And although it's common for people to experience emotional challenges after trauma, their symptoms can lessen in intensity over time as they continue to heal. However, some people who struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder find themselves experiencing symptoms that continue to cause them significant distress. In fact, many people with PTSD experience these memory-related difficulties caused by changes to both the structure and the function of their hippocampus. That is your emotional brain. If you want to learn more about how your brain controls your behavior and mental well-being, I've put a link in the description below to a free video and downloadable guide that I've put together with Dr. Zoe Webb, who's a practicing clinical psychologist. The video and guide walk you through three ways that your brain can help you understand your behavior and mental well-being. I hope you enjoy them and see you in the next video.